Hello. We continue our study of bifurcation phenomena and dynamics in simple nonlinear systems, uh, focusing again on the uh, logistic map as we have been looking at it uh, in some detail over the past few lectures. Uh, but today, uh, we will look at some other phenomena in the same system. Let us recap what we studied in the last few lectures. Uh, the logistic map x n plus 1 is equal to a x n into uh, 1 minus x n or r x n that is the parameter nonlinearity parameter. As you vary r, uh, you find that initially period 1 orbits are stable. There is a transcritical bifurcation that happens uh, before we get into this particular frame at which another period 1 orbit is born and we go along a particular locus up till the value r is equal to 3 where there is a period doubling bifurcation. Uh, we get a, a stable period 2 orbit. There is another period doubling bifurcation over here. We get a stable period 4 orbit which then leads to a period 8 orbit and so on all the way up till r to the power r 2 to the power n, n being large numbers going eventually to aperiodic uh, motion. There is a lot of detail in this bifurcation diagram of course, uh, particular attention for today's lecture will be on the period 3 window over here and we note from what uh, we have learnt in the last lecture about the Sharkovsky sequence that by the time period 3 is born namely at this value of r uh, square root of 8 plus 1. Uh, at this value of r, there are all periodic orbits uh, will have occurred by then. In, and we also know furthermore that at r is equal to 4, there are periodic orbits of all periods and all of them are unstable. Okay. Now that we have reminded ourselves of this uh, bifurcation diagram for the logistic map, let us see what varying r does. When r is equal to 1.5, a, tra a trajectory of the system gives you a period 1 orbit. Well, it is off the screen over here, but there is a period 1 orbit at r is equal to 1.5. At r is equal to 3.4, uh, a period 2 orbit is stable and that we recognize uh, over here at 3.4 namely somewhere over here we have this period 2 orbit uh, that one can see. At r is equal to 4 we have an orbit that goes all over the interval. This is an aperiodic orbit because there is no stable periodic orbit. We know this for sure. Such dynamics which completely covers the interval in which the map is functional is often called fully developed chaos because it is over the entire line over here. At r is equal to 3.828 which is just below where period 3 is born, trajectories look very different. In particular, they look almost periodic for a certain period of time. Then it looks aperiodic and chaotic and then this sequence uh, occurs again. And in today's uh, lecture, we will worry about the dynamics that, that looks, that appears like so, where does it come from and what are the implications. So let us look at the period 3 window in some detail. Uh, we look at the bifurcation diagram as well as the Lyapunov exponent and we are going to also look at the densities and so on and so forth. So over here schematically we have the uh, bifurcation diagram and superimposed is the uh, graph of the Lyapunov exponent which uh, is you know with axes etc is drawn over here. Notice that this by the tangent bifurcation occurs at r sub t which is indicated here and it is 3.8 uh, 284 etc etc now just below this point of tangency 
as you can see on the graph of the Lyapunov exponent over here, the Lyapunov exponent is positive. Okay? So, this says that the dynamics just below the tangent bifurcation is actually chaotic. Once you have this tangency, there is a bifurcation, the Lyapunov exponent becomes 0 at the bifurcation and we know that because we know that the slope of the map is equal to 1 in modulus and therefore, the Lyapunov exponent is 0 and subsequently a period 3 orbit is born. The period 3 orbit um, is born at through a tangency, so there is a stable periodic orbit of period 3 and an unstable periodic orbit of period 3, uh, both born at the same time. And so, if we look at the dynamics, let us say over here, this is a periodic orbit and uh, it will be, a tra you know, the, uh, the, the uh, all the, almost all the initial conditions are going to be attracted to this period 3 orbit. Now, the period 3 orbit is, uh, if I write it out over here, x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4 is equal to x 1, x 5 is equal to x 2, x 6 is equal to x 3 and so on and so forth. Okay? So, now let me just take any arbitrary orbit and then look at the third iterate of every point. Within this period 3 window, that is this window over here that uh, you know in which we can see that is basically period 3 behavior, note that this function f 3 of x has 3 stable fixed points and 3 unstable fixed points as well. Okay? So, over here the slope is bigger than 1, over here the slope is less than 1. So, this is part of the stable periodic orbit. Uh, and we can, you know, check over here, and this will also be a part of it. And uh, will uh, this this point over here? So those three form the stable periodic orbit of period three. The other three points of intersection form the unstable uh, periodic orbits of period three. Now, if you start with the point half, that is the map maximum, one quickly reaches the period three orbit. But if one only joins every third iterate, you can see the fixed point as I have done over here. The green orbit over here is the period 3 orbit. So, first point, second point, third point, first point, second point, third point, etcetera, etcetera. Now, if I join only every third point, I have got this point joined to that, joined to that and you can see that that now just looks like a fixed point. So, the figure of on this side is for the value of r 3.829, which is above the bifurcation point. Now, below the point of tangency, uh, however, the map looks something like this. There are no fixed points, but this curve is appearing almost to touch the diagonal little less almost over here and a little more almost over there. But what one can see is that at uh, below the point of tangency, the curve comes very close to the diagonal. So, there is an almost fixed point over there. And what does an orbit look like? Well, here is an image of the orbit at that same value of, uh, of r, uh, which is a little below uh, 3.8284, etc. And if I just were to join all the points, I get this image. And if I were to join only every third point, then I get this image. So, you can see that for a certain period of iterations, it stays very close to this fixed point. Then suddenly, it escapes and goes close to this fixed point and then it escapes again and it comes back out here and then again it comes back to that fixed point and then to this fixed point and that fixed point and so on and so forth. So, if you join every third iterate rather than joining every iterate, you see that the orbit is stuck very close to this almost fixed point for a while. Then it leaves and it goes close to some other of the almost fixed points and so on and so forth. And you can see that this behavior is a consequence of the fact that we are not yet at the uh, point of tangency, uh, but we are just below it. 
this is the hallmark of what is called in intermittency in the dynamics. And the name probably comes from the fact that intermittency, especially in fluid flow, refers to the fact that you have something that is smooth and laminar for a while, and then suddenly there is a little, you know, a sort of turbulent motion, and then again there's smooth motion for a while, and then again some uh, whirlpools and eddies and so on in real fluid flows. And some of you may have seen this in uh, flows on a river or some, you know, similar, uh, similar locations. But the word intermittency now uh, should mean whenever you, you have something that looks very periodic, smooth, laminar for a while, and it is interrupted by something which is not of the same period and is, uh, has got some other kind of characteristic. The motion is chaotic because the Lyapunov exponent for such motion is positive, as we have just seen. But close to the point of tangency, near this almost fixed point, the dynamics could appear periodic for very long durations. And a typical image of an intermittent flow is like what I have shown over here. You have got something that looks periodic uh, for fairly long periods of time, and in between there are these chaotic bursts. The closer we are to the tangency, uh, note that at the tangency we have a periodic orbit, so it is going to be a periodic orbit forever. But close to this tangency, these chaotic bursts become rarer and rarer and less, uh, and, and less frequent. All right? The reason for this uh, can be seen by looking at the map in some detail. In the vicinity of this tangency, the map, uh, as one can show, which is almost going to be tangential to it, to this diagonal line, takes a particularly simple form. In particular, it has this so-called normal form that y n plus 1 is y n plus y n squared plus epsilon. When epsilon is equal to 0, you will see that the um, the fixed point is at y n is equal to 0. But the moment epsilon is different from 0, this curve is no longer tangential to the, uh, uh, is, uh, is no longer tangential uh, to this diagonal line. And any orbit that comes in over here, let us say, following our procedure for drawing these orbits, you go from the diagonal to the curve to the diagonal, to the curve, and so on. But in order to, you see, the orbit is now going to stay or take a very large number of steps in this region because the uh, bottleneck over here is very, very narrow. And how many steps will it take? Well, that is the amount of time that the, period, the orbit will look almost periodic because it is very close to this fixed point that is going to be created over here. So, it will look almost periodic for as many steps as it takes to escape from this bottleneck. Now, the narrower the gap, you can clearly see that it is going to take many, many more steps. And when the gap is 0, it never escapes from that fixed point, namely, it is on a periodic orbit. Outside this region, the dynamics does whatever it does. But near this point of tangency, it is just going to take a lot of very, very small steps to get out. And the number of iterations needed to cross this channel is of the order of 1 upon epsilon, uh, the 1 upon the square root of epsilon, where epsilon is the distance from the point of tangency. Now, the point, uh, so therefore, the average time between the bursts is going to go as r minus r t to the power minus half. And uh, this, this characterizes an, in the intermittent dynamics. Now, what I have described over here is the intermittent dynamics near a point of tangency. And that is uh, described by, it was first described explicitly by Pomo and Manville uh, in the early 1980s. 
and uh, they characterized it as one of three possible types of intermittency that can occur. Uh, the, in the first type, which is you can see just a slightly uh, shrunken version of the same one, the same image that I have shown earlier on, um, they, the characteristic behavior is that a real eigenvalue crosses the unit circle at plus 1. There are two other types that they describe, type 2 and type 3, uh, which are also you know, discussed in this particular image. The important part is that intermittent motion always shows a characteristic power law kind of scaling. And this time between bursts, so to speak, uh, is, has, is, you know, from the point of view of the, uh, the distance from the bifurcation point, uh, it goes as some negative power theta. In the case of type 1 intermittency, which is the one we've just discussed, uh, the exponent theta is a half and uh, for these other two types, uh, the exponent theta is equal to 1. Now, there are other types of intermittency that people have discussed, but all of them by and large will have this uh, form, namely a, uh, namely a uh, power law scaling at this point of intermittency and the dynamics to some approximation looks like this. Basically, you have motion of one kind interspersed with motion of the other kind. And at the point of bifurcation, you have all motion of the one kind. So you can always distinguish uh, between the two types of motion that you see over here contributing to the intermittency. Another scenario where intermittency happens is at what are called crises. Now, crises are special points in the bifurcation diagram, uh, as I'm going to show you now for unimodal maps, but uh, this is quite common in many, many kinds of systems. There is no explicit bifurcation per se. So, for example, the Lyapunov exponent does not actually pass through a zero. Although there is a marked change in the dynamics before and after this crisis point. For the kind of crises that I'm going to describe in the next few slides, uh, the basic feature of this, <coughs> of this so-called, uh, this phenomenon, this change, this dynamical transition is that a chaotic attractor changes discontinuously in size. Crises were described, uh, you know, formally by Ott and uh, by the Maryland group uh, in the early 1980s. And uh, there are basically three kinds that they discuss. The exterior crisis where a chaotic attractor uh, hits a particular point, like a periodic point, and actually disappears. There's an interior crisis where an attractor expands abruptly, an emerging crisis where two attractors merge to become one larger attractor. Now, in the logistic map, in the bifurcation diagram, there are examples of two of these kinds of crises, and I will discuss that just now. Uh, we started out by saying that we'd look at the period three window, uh, and let me just remind you that the period three window we started looking at, uh, we examined this part of the period three window as far as the tangency, the tangent bifurcation, and the intermittency was concerned. Now we are going to look at this part of the period three window. And I would just like to point out that the period 3 window also shows period doubling bifurcations. In particular, over here, you see that the period 3 orbit now splits at this point through a period doubling bifurcation to a period 6 orbit. And then there is a period 12 orbit and so on and so forth. So the period doubling cascade happens over here as well. However, we are going to, however, we are going to look at this part of the diagram 
and uh, where we see that there is a crisis occurring. Now, this crisis point is very visible at this location, where you notice that there is an, uh, the chaotic attractor which has three branches. Here is the period doubling uh, leading to the, uh, you know, this was an orbit of period 3, then period orbit 3 times 2, then this is 3 times 2 squared and so on and so forth all the way up till 3 times 2 to the n, n going to infinity. So, we have the period doubling cascade over there. And yes, uh, that cascade is also geometrically characterized by the same two Feigenbaum constants that we discussed a couple of lectures ago. But let us look at this particular point over here. At this point, we find that this chaotic attractor, which was initially just consisting of these three portions over here, suddenly becomes, uh, it suddenly occupies this entire period on uh, this entire portion of the phase space. Basically, what has happened is that this, uh, when the, at the point of tangency, recall that there was a period, a stable period 3 orbit and an unstable period 3 orbit. When this unstable period 3 orbit collides with this chaotic attractor at this point over here, there is a sudden expansion in the width of the attractor uh, leading to this, uh, at, at this particular point of the crisis. Okay. So, the interior crisis in the period 3 window is the abrupt expansion of the chaotic attractor. If I looked at the orbit on this side of the crisis, the density, now this is a, a plotting the density of the orbit on the, uh, in the phase space. So, this invariant density is concentrated in three regions. There is one over here, one in the middle and one uh, on the top that is over there. So, these three parts uh, contribute to this density uh, on this side of the crisis. On the other side of the crisis, let us say if I took a point somewhere over here, the density still has features that you see uh, in the earlier, earlier diagram, but as you can see now it is continuous. It actually extends entirely over this entire region from there till uh, so. So, the crisis is marked by a discontinuous change if you like in the support of the invariant density. Uh, if I looked at the dynamics before and after the interior crisis, and now I would just look at the third iterate. When I am on this side, every third iterate goes onto a chaotic orbit that lives in this particular region over here, and, uh, and it uh, looks like so. It, this is a completely chaotic orbit, but it is confined to that uh, inner band. After the interior crisis has happened, that chaotic orbit escapes from that region, although like any uh, intermittent motion, it stays close to this almost um, chaotic attractor over here, uh, moves to this part for a while, comes down to this part for a while. And so, this kind of motion is also intermittent except that now we have intermittency going between two different kinds of chaotic attractors. So much for the interior crisis. Another kind of crisis also occurs in the, um, in, in the logistic map. Uh, there are a lot of features in this logistic map as one can see. Uh, and here we have two chaotic bands merging to form a single chaotic band. Recall again in the bifurcation diagram that you have a period 2 orbit, which then becomes a period 4 orbit, but the points of the period 4 orbit are always alternating between the upper and the lower branch, period 8, all the powers of 2 oscillating between the, the upper and the lower branch, all the way down here where the points alternate between the upper and the lower branch. 
After this point over here, you notice that there is no distinction between the upper and the lower branch. These two branches, these two chaotic bands have merged to form a single chaotic band. And if I were to look at the invariant density before and after this merging crisis, it looks like so. Before the merging crisis, I have two well-separated regions of support for this invariant density. And after the merging crisis, it still remembers the old, uh, the way in which the density is distributed, but now it is actually continuous over the entire region where it is, uh, where, where the orbit lives. So these two chaotic bands now merge to form a single chaotic band at this particular point. And there is a, an unstable periodic orbit which actually hits the chaotic attractor at that particular point. So the merging crisis, the attractor merging crisis, uh, can also be dis uh, discussed in terms, or it should properly be discussed in terms of the collision of an unstable periodic orbit with a chaotic attractor. The crisis-induced intermittency, if I now look at the second iterate, looks something like this. Every second iterate in the, uh, you know, prior to this merging crisis is on the same uh, branch of the attractor. And you see that it is confined to just that branch of the attractor. After the crisis, for some time it is on this branch, some time it is on that branch, and so on and so forth. So you, you see that this intermittent dynamics now takes you between two somewhat different kinds of motion, and they also are characterized by power law distributions. I should also like to point out that there are many band mergings that happen. Uh, here is the case where two bands merge to one. Here is a case where four bands merge to two, and a case where eight bands merge to four, and 16 bands merge to 8. As a matter of fact, if this is where the 2 bands merge, if this is where the 4 bands merge, this is where the 8 bands merged and the 16 bands merged, all these will now, there will be similar series of band mergings in what are called reverse bifurcations or noisy periodicity by Lorentz. Uh, and they all uh, this goes to 2 to the n, and as n goes to infinity, these all will accumulate at the same value of r, namely r infinity. So we have this very interesting sequence of forward bifurcations accumulating at r infinity, and reverse bifurcations also accumulating at r infinity, and in a very uh, nice, uh, satisfying kind of geometric picture. Again, these bifurcations will also be characterized by the same values of delta and alpha as the forward bifurcations are. Now, there's an interesting feature of the bifurcation diagram that I'd like to draw your attention to. What you see over here is the bifurcation diagram from 2.8 to 4 uh, in R. And if I were to just focus on a small portion of this if I look at it over here, this looks pretty much like the entire bifurcation diagram. I needn't stop over here. I can go in and look at that portion. And that portion now looks again like the old diagram. And this portion of the blow up again looks pretty much like the diagram itself. So we see that this geometric picture over here repeats almost exactly, not exact, not perfectly, but almost in smaller and smaller scales as we uh, as, as we look at different portions of this of this figure. So there is a self-similarity in this bifurcation diagram. A part of the image is very similar to the whole image. And this keeps repeating on smaller and smaller scales. 
Now, such self-similarity is characteristic of what is called fractal geometry. Uh, this is a term introduced by Benoit Mandelbrot, and this is useful in describing a number of features of nonlinear systems, uh, and this is what we will turn to in the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you.